Hi, my name is Andreas Lepakis. Welcome to this visual lecture about a proposed new cause and treatment for multiple sclerosis. I'm a doctor at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, Canada. I'm also a researcher who has spent much of the last three decades studying the benefits and harms of treatments for a variety of diseases. I'd like to tell you the story of a new proposed cause and treatment for multiple sclerosis, or MS, called Chronic Cerebrospinal Venous Insufficiency, or CCSVI. Recently, like many Canadians, I've been struck by the dramatic and immediate improvement after the treatment of neck vein abnormalities that have been reported on YouTube and elsewhere by many people with MS. Although I'm not a neurologist, I know that MS can be a miserable disease and that current treatments aren't that good. I can understand the excitement that these positive reports have caused. If they're representative of the experience of most patients, then the new treatment would be a major advance and would change the way we think about MS. Part of being a researcher is the ability to rethink things and come up with new ideas. However, researchers should also be skeptics. We need to be skeptical of both existing dogma and new ideas. As a researcher, I know that many treatments that have been introduced with great hope and excitement have turned out to be useless or to cause harm. Therefore, despite their dramatic nature, I don't find the reports about CCSVI totally convincing. Do all patients undergoing the procedure really get such amazing improvements? I want to know more about the benefits all patients receive and how long those benefits last before I'm convinced that this new procedure is working. Having said that, the many reports of dramatic responses deserve to be taken seriously and should not be dismissed. A first step is to summarize all of the research that has been reported to date on this topic. Some colleagues in Toronto and Calgary and I have done this, and I'm going to tell you what we found. Let's start with a quick overview of neck veins and MS. It's quite an interesting story. About three years ago, Dr. Paolo Zamboni, a physician from Italy whose wife has MS, suggested that all people with multiple sclerosis had abnormalities of the veins draining the brain and spinal cord, and that these abnormalities were not present in any people who did not have MS. He called these abnormalities CCSVI, which is diagnosed with an ultrasound test. Dr. Zamboni used this method to examine five different aspects of blood flow and anatomy of the veins. As defined by Dr. Zamboni, a diagnosis of CCSVI is made if two or more of these five items are abnormal. Around the same time that he described CCSVI, Dr. Zamboni reported on 60 patients with MS who he had diagnosed with the condition. Each patient had a narrowing or kink in at least one neck vein and had those abnormalities treated by having a balloon blown up within the vein. Some patients also had a stent inserted which is a cage that's often used to keep arteries open. Dr. Zamboni reported that there were no serious side effects from the treatment. Patients with relapsing remitting MS had an improvement in their MS symptoms, but the patients with progressive MS had no improvement. In medicine, when faced with a new discovery, we tend to do two things. First, we test the intervention out on other people in other settings to see if we get the same result. And second, we combine all the studies to look for common themes. Our research group searched for all published studies of CCSVI that met certain criteria and summarized the results. Let's start with the question of whether CCSVI is more common in people with MS. We were able to find 10 studies that used ultrasound to diagnose CCSVI and that compared a group of people with MS with people who did not have MS. What we found was a huge variation in the results of these studies both in terms of the frequency with which MS patients were found to have CCSVI and whether CCSVI was more common in people with MS than those without. On one extreme was Dr. Zamboni's exceptionally dramatic study, a result that is almost unheard of in medicine, which found CCSVI in 100% of people with MS and no people without MS. On the other extreme was a smaller study from Germany that found no CCSVI in anyone, whether or not they had MS. And in the middle was the largest study from the United States that found CCSVI in 61% of people with MS, 26% of healthy people, and 46% of people with neurological diseases other than MS. When we combined all the data from all studies, we found that CCSVI was 13 times more likely to be found in persons with MS than healthy people. 
If we remove the study from Dr. Zamboni because of its exceptional results and combine the other nine studies, it changed to five times more likely. However, we quickly realized that the discrepancies among the studies meant that it is very difficult to interpret the results of the combined analysis. When results differ to this extent, apples and oranges, so to speak, it makes more sense to focus on trying to understand why the results are so different. We tried to think of the potential causes of the different results and considered three possible factors. Number one, CCSVI is a newly described entity. Different groups might be using different ultrasound methods to assess the veins. Number two, doing an ultrasound test can be quite subjective. Minor changes in pressure on the skin or breathing patterns of the person being examined can affect the results, as can the bias of the person performing the test itself. And number three, some of the 10 studies were blinded, meaning that the person doing the ultrasound didn't know whether or not the person being examined had MS, and some were not blinded. Unfortunately, none of the studies that said they were unblinded reported on the success of blinding. In the end, unfortunately, we couldn't explain the reason for the differences in results. This means that our systematic review of ultrasound studies is inconclusive. Based on the research to date, we just can't say with authority whether or not CCSVI is more common in people with MS. More studies are needed. Let's move to a second question. What are the harms of dilating the veins in someone who's been diagnosed with CCSVI? Let's first review what happens when CCSVI is treated. Patients are taken to a procedure room. The skin in the groin is frozen, and a catheter is inserted into the femoral vein, the big vein in the groin. The catheter is then advanced so that it passes through the right side of the heart and into the neck veins. To make sure that the vein narrowing shown on ultrasound really exists, dye is shot through the catheter and x-rays are taken. If this test shows one or more of the veins to be narrowed, a catheter with a deflated balloon on it is passed through the femoral vein and positioned so that the balloon is at the location of the narrowing in the vein. The balloon is then inflated, which opens up the narrowing. If all goes well, the vein stays stretched open after the balloon is deflated. However, sometimes the vein narrows right back down again. If that occurs, the doctor may decide to insert a stent in the area of persistent narrowing to hold the area open. Generally, people leave the clinic or hospital a few hours after the procedure. Most people are asked to take a blood thinner for a few weeks. We found six studies that reported on the complications that occurred at the time of or immediately after the vein dilation procedure. In total, about 1,100 patients were studied. The results were much more consistent than was the case with the diagnostic studies. The most frequent serious complication was an abnormality in the rhythm of the heart, which occurred in between 1 and 2 percent of patients, presumably because the catheter passes through the heart chambers. None of the patients died or had long-term consequences, but in some cases, these heart rhythm abnormalities were very serious. One woman needed to go to the intensive care unit and was briefly on an artificial breathing machine. About 1 in 10 people experienced headaches and neck pain for a few hours after the procedure. To summarize, the vein dilation procedure is generally well tolerated, and a serious heart rhythm abnormality occurs in 1 to 2 percent of people at the time of the procedure. Unfortunately, very few studies reported the frequency of complications in the days to months after the procedure. We know that some patients have had serious complications, including death, during this time period. These complications include clotting at the site of the vein dilation or stent, major bleeding because of the blood thinners, and movement of the stent to the heart. However, we do not know how often these occur. The final question that our systematic review addresses is what we know about the benefits of vein dilation. Here, the quality of the research is poor, which means we can't be sure. Many people who have had a vein dilation procedure have reported dramatic, almost immediate improvement in a number of symptoms. Four studies without control groups, MS patients who were not treated with vein dilation, have reported improvement in a number of symptoms, such as fatigue after vein dilation. However, when trying to understand how beneficial a new treatment is, the gold standard in medical research is the randomized trial. In a randomized trial, half of the patients are given the active therapy, in this case vein dilation, and the other half serve as an untreated control group. In this case, they would have the venogram, but they would not have any veins dilated. Patients who agree to participate in the trial are randomly, like the flip of a coin, assigned to one of the two groups. There are a number of reasons randomized trials are considered necessary to reliably determine the benefits of treatments. First, if we receive a treatment that we really think will work, we sometimes feel better even if the treatment doesn't work. 
Second, sometimes symptoms can improve spontaneously, and one thinks that the improvement was due to a treatment rather than the natural course of the disease. Third, doctors also want new treatments to work, and if they know that a patient received a treatment that they think is effective, they're more likely to report an improvement in their patient. All this means that in order to really know whether vein dilation improves symptoms in MS, and if it does, by how much, randomized trials are needed. It's usual to conduct two or more randomized trials of a new treatment so that one can see how consistent the results are in different groups of patients being treated for by different doctors. No randomized trials of vein dilation in people with MS have been reported, although at least four are underway or are being planned. When these studies are completed, we will have a much better understanding of the effects of vein dilation in people with CCSVI and MS. Until then, we won't really know. Our group will be regularly updating our systematic review every four months or so. The results will be posted on our website, www.ccsvireviews.ca, and we hope you'll visit us from time to time. Thanks for listening.